Welcome to Talking Giants, presented by Seek Geek. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. First off-season episode, and it is a handful, Justin. The Giants fired Bobby Johnson, their offensive line coach, their special teams coordinator, Thomas McGahee, their outside linebacker coach, Drew Wilkins, and oh, by the way, Wink Martindale resigned after Brian Dable said they expected him back in the morning. We got a lot to talk about. This Wink thing, man, there's so many layers to it, and I, I want to hit every single angle of this. Justin, how are you? Yeah, weird day. Weird day where you start off uh, 8.30 a.m., very interesting time to... Calculated, obviously. ...to uh, throw a press conference. Uh, you announce before that 8.30 a.m. early morning press conference that you're firing two coaches that you were expecting to fire. And you're like, oh, I expect Wink Martindale and Mike Kafka to be back. Oh, cool. All right. Expecting is the interesting term here. And then lo and behold, a couple hours later, Charlotte Carroll breaks that the Wilkins brothers are gone. And then a little while after that, Link Martindale is resigning, not fired. So uh, quite an interesting day. Bobby Skinner, let's let's break it all down. I do. I want to do like two separate conversations with Wink. Like one, him as the football coach and why this stinks, right? Why it stinks that this that Wink Martindale is no longer the defense coordinator. Not the end of the world, but I, I don't like it. But I also want to talk about how we got there. Do you? I mean, and I, I feel like you can't talk about you know, Wink is the defensive coordinator without talking about how we got here, right? The Jay Glazer before the Patriots game comes out and says, it's bad. There is tension between these two. It's not going to last. It could end before the season, right? So some very real tension through that, right? And we don't know wh what all that ca caused that, right? There's rumors that the Xavier McKinney situation was an issue. The way that Dable, you know, may yell or get on, you know, uh, you know, coaches like Wink Martindale. Uh, those are kind of the things that we heard from it. Um, and we don't hear much about it afterwards. The only thing we hear is Brian Dable shut it down, right? Brian Dable likes to, you know, say, oh, the only thing we fight about is a pizza pizza. And it's gave him the game ball, which is a little patronizing and saying, yeah, no, everything's fine. You know, uh, you know, we don't, we don't argue about anything. And then Wink Martindale took a opposite approach and did everything but deny it, right? Did, did no nope, er, nothing everything's the change same as same as last year which basically saying we had issues last year as well too you know went and talked to the you know basically wink wink you know no pun intended wink wink at everybody who asked like yeah there's issues but i'm not gonna flat out say to you in front of a microphone that there's issues and i have it on pretty good authority the same authority that you know when i had the the uh, the inkling that wink martindale was going to get the d coordinator job and that he was going to get interviewed here a couple years ago I have it on good authority that Wink Martindale wanted to be fired. Like, he, if he was going to leave this organization, he wanted to leave and get fired so he can collect the rest of his paycheck Because since he signed a three-year deal. Yeah, and so Wink has basically did that. You know, told Pam Oliver, yeah, we got to play. We got to play defense and offense, too. We got to outscore. You know, we got to outscore the other offense and our own offense. Basically, kind of threw that at every... You know, uh, on the Eagles game, put the 24 Jack Bauer thing on his play sheet, basically saying 24 hours until I'm gone. Um, and, you know, this is all heading for divorce, right? But we really never hear, like, how, like, Brian Dable's side of it. We're just kind of hearing, like, to, all right, Justin, I want to ask you this. Yes. Is it obvious to you that Wink Martindale is the source of the Jay Glazer report? Y y yes. Yes. Here's where I'm mad, right? And I'm I'm mad that this didn't work out. Oh, here's the only question. Here's the only question I have about that, by the way. I want to save that thought. Jay Glazer hinted at it could have been a firing in season, and that's the only pause that I give to that. Well, he said it could it could not last until in season. Basically, saying they'd have there's a lot of tension and these guys just don't get along at all. Right. Yeah. But um, I mean, I, it makes sense to me. Like, why would? Because again, the the outside looking in, and I I think we differ on this a little bit. Like, I I think this is like this is a bad look on Brian Dable, but Wink Martindale certainly is not an innocent an innocent party. See, this is where I disagree. It's a bad. It's bad for Wink Martindale because he had a, a defensive coordinator who most people think is a good at his job lose. I think it's bad for Brian Dable. I don't think it's a bad look at, uh, on Brian Dable. I think it's a bad look on Wink Martindale if you really dive deep into what actually happened. Like Wink Martindale spent the last seven, eight weeks basically like trying to force their hand to fire him, and 
Brian Dable, you can call this dirty or not. They had their 8.30 a.m. press conference to get ahead of it and say, I expect Wink Martindale back. Even though he knew that Wink Martindale wasn't coming back, I expect him to come back. I think we want continuity. We want to do a good job. Wink has said, this is a destination plot. Because Wink has played the fucking media and used the media to his advantage for eight straight weeks since he got here, dude. And and embarrass Xavier McKinney. They be all, if it benefits Wink Martindale, Wink Martindale will go to the media. He Again, Brian Dable tried to calm it down, give the game ball, try and cut. Like, hey, everything's steady below deck, right? Even though it wasn't. Tried to calm the seas. Where Wink Martindale's done everything but that. Done everything but that for his own good trying to get fired. And I understand not wanting to be here or whatever, and we'll talk about all that, and it sucks that it's led to this. But to me, I am glad that the Giants are not firing Wink Martindale. I am glad that they own his contract, and they can, and he can, and Wink Martindale is not free to go wherever he wants. Because he spent the last eight years going, or last eight weeks going on a fire me tour. So I have no problem with Dable punching back a little bit for the first time since Dable's been here, actually using the media to his advantage and, and having his 8.30 a.m. press conference and saying, we want Wink back. It's, and saying it's Wink decision. Cause guess what? It is Wink's decision. I, and, and to me, this points to a defensive coordinator, Wink Martindale, who made no effort to fix this. Now, maybe Brian Dable didn't either, right? But I know from all of this, I can read the context that Wink Martindale spent no effort to try and fix this. Yeah, I, I come from it where I think Brian Dable could be. I think this is all speculative. Like I, hey, I, I think that context that, that you're saying is, is it makes sense. But I'm still wondering, well, why did the relationship get so fractured? Why did it get to a point where Wink Martindale wanted to be fired from this job? Like, what? how did it get to that point? And, and, I, and I think, I, again, my theory is that, I, and I hope this is not the case, because I still do believe that, Brian Dable's the right coach for this team, and I still am excited for the future. And for me, Bobby, and I think you're in the same boat, it's not it's not a, that Wink Martindale is the best defense coordinator this organization has seen since Bill Belichick, and the fact that we lost him means it's the end of the world. I have I have more questions surrounding the process in which he's leaving. That that's my that's my concern. I agree hundred percent. Yeah, and I and I think Based on some rumors that we heard about both coordinators, not just Wink Martindale, both coordinators wanting to leave, just rumors, um, Brian Dable, knowing that Brian Dable can be a difficult coach to work with, he is a very much a player's coach. You know, we heard that he runs a country club, the practices in training camp are way more lax to some of the other previous regimes. And possibly behind the scenes, if Dable's going to be somewhat of a fiery guy, maybe those coaches are receiving the brunt of it. And Wink Martindale's defense, at least this year, has been the unit that, you know, through certain weeks has carried this this team and has carried this unit. And those heads might have crunched a few times. And here's, so to, about today, they knew they were going to fire Wilkins and the, the two brothers. They knew they were going to fire him. They, uh, very planned, very planned. 8.30 a.m. press conference. We're going to fire the two co- the two coaches, the coordinator and Bobby Johnson. We're going to fire those two people. Everybody expects us to do that, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to move on. We're going to find new replacements, blah, 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 blah. Cool. Those are the coaches that everybody wanted. Everybody got their blood. They knew they were going to fire these guys, and they knew that Wink Martindale wasn't going to come back. And I think it's it was kind of a weak move to not face the music because Dable says we're, we expect them to be back. So then guess what? All the questions go away of, I want to hear Brian Dable's answer to, there are reports of, you do not work well with others. What do you have to say about that? And all those questions went away the second he said, I expect Kafka and Wink to be back. I hope we get to hear those questions next time we hear. But honestly, it's I be have the combine no, and nobody's going to care, I have, man. But I have no, I have no problem with them going on the offensive when Wink did it all. And you know what? Good, goodbye, Drew Wilkins. How could hey? How come B- Brian Dable is expected to fire his good friend Bobby Johnson? Why? Why is he expected to fire his good friend Bobby Johnson? Because the offensive line performed the worst in the fucking NFL with high draft assets. 
So why does Wink Martindale, not the head coach, get to have his fucking def- outside linebacker coach while Kayvon Thibodeau, Aziz Ojolari take two years dips in their fucking pass rush win rate? Out of 79 fucking outside linebackers, Drew, we have the dead last in Jihad Ward. We got to bring back Jihad Ward because Wink said he's got a lifetime contract with them. Fucking Aziz Ojolari went for, is 74th in the NFL. Aziz Ojolari's pass rush win rate went 6.7% as a rookie, 10.7% in the second year, and then 5.4%. Kayvon saw a 3.3% drop. Well, Kayvon gets sacks. That's because Kayvon's a fucking good pass rusher, and he his athletic ability and his natural ability was able to get into some sacks when he played bad tackles. But there was no consistency to his, to his game. So again, I like Wink Martindale as a defensive coordinator, but why does Wink Martindale get to fucking have everything he wants and Brian Dable doesn't? And Wink Martindale gets to go and play the media and Brian Dable just has to sit back and take it. That's just bend over and take it because because fucking uh, the shades and and sleeveless Wink Martindale wants to be cool. How come Brian Dable can't go throw, you know, why can't Brian Dable throw Tommy DeVito under the bus while Wink Martindale goes to fucking make Xavier McKinney look like a fool? Made, made him look like a fool. Made one of your best players look... And again, Xavier McKinney did, was a fool. What he said was stupid. We talked about it. But we also talked about it, Justin, that that was bullshit by Wink Martindale. It would have been one thing for Wink Martindale to address it and say it was bothered. We talked about it. He spent eight fucking straight minutes making Xavier McKinney looking like the dumbest motherfucker on the team. So I'm sorry that we're cussing in all this. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm so fired up that this idea that Wink Martindale is some damn martyr. Good. I'm glad your outside linebacker coach got fired. And I hope, I hope you never get to, I hope they, they force the other team to give us a second round pick. I hope you don't get the coach anywhere. I hope you make no money. Like, I'm, I'm pissed, dude. I'm pissed at how this has has been turned. And I hope we improve as a defense quarter. How come Brian Dable, when his offense was ninth in EPA per play last year, and Wink Martindale's was 28th per EPA play, and we've got to play a perfect game to beat the Minnesota Vikings in the playoffs? A perfect game. Like one drop by Darius Slayton stopped them from scoring on essentially every single drive, and they almost lost the game because Wink Martindale's defense couldn't stop a nosebleed. Again, I need clarification on why the relationship got fractured in the first place. Is it because of Wink Martindale and, and ego, or is it Brian Dable and ego? And what, what we've been saying for the majority of the year, and kind of since this came out, is Brian Dable and ego, and Brian Dable possibly being difficult to work with. Um, that, that, that's where, Agreed. that's where I'm, I'm, I'm leaning, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. Like, I'm not being like, you're wrong, and I disagree, and Wink Martindale's a saint. I, I'm not saying that. But, I'm still not shutting down the notion that this is a bad look on Brian Dable. I'm not shutting that down. They what they really should have done, I would I would have again, I would have loved for full transparency. I would have loved it. They knew they were going to they knew this was going to happen. They knew it. And it was very strategic and very structured and I think it is kind of a uh, it's it's a weak look that they did it after they spoke to the media where the I Wilkins brothers care. and and Wink Martindale. After after taking ten jabs from Wink Martindale the last few weeks, I'm not I'm not I'm not mad at them for coming back with a mean right hook. They fucking Muhammad Ali rumble in the jungle. Come on, take your jabs, take your jabs. Because when the fucking ninth round comes, whatever round that ended up happening, I'm knocking your ass out. Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef crafted recipes at a price you'll like, delivered right to your door. Make saving time your breeziest resolution with quick, convenient recipes delivered right to you. Just choose your meals and select your delivery date. HelloFresh handles the meal planning and shopping, so all you have to do is open your weekly box of pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step recipes to get cooking. I love HelloFresh. They bring good stuff. We cook out of it. Also, because like it comes fresh and they bring it like the freezer bags, I use those in my cooler too. So it's like you get food and some like sick, you know, uh, freezers. Uh, don't let recipe boredom strike because HelloFresh has more options than ever before. Dig into the biggest menu yet with over 45 dinner options to choose from weekly and even more market add on items that suit any lifestyle so we've been making some good stuff we made some shepherd's pie there's some good stuff on there go to hellofresh.com slash world free not the free world world free and use code world free for free breakfast for life one breakfast item per box while subscription is active that's free back bre- breakfast for life at hellofresh.com slash world free with code world free and start using america's number one meal kit today you'll be glad you did so I agree, Justin, and after all that, I am pissed. But I do want to talk about Wink Martindale's defense and why 
I'm not happy that this has happened. I'm, I, I am mad that it's got to this point, right? And that's, that's I, I, I don't even like using the word bad look. It's just bad. I think it's bad that, like you said, that we are not going to have a defensive coordinator for not fo- yeah. for non-football reasons. It is bad that a good coach is leaving the New York Giants when there was an opportunity. And, you know, Joe Shane, uh, you know, Research Rick clip, clipped up that, you know, Joe Shane talked about in his introductory press conference, continuity is very important and it is a reason that teams have success, quote, end quote, from his introductory press conference. They talked about, well, Brian Dable talked about con- continuity when saying that, Mike Kafka and Wink Mondale are expected back. That continuity is such a good thing. And you know, it really would have been cool to see Bobby Okereke year two in that system, Dexter Lawrence year three as a nose tackle in that system, Kayvon Thibodeau, even year three of Kayvon Thibodeau, who's young and had double digit sacks. Um, you know, and, and even going back to Xavier McKinney and even a guy like Jason Pinnock that was, you know, you're able to create negative plays because you have a defensive coordinator that puts guys in a in a good spot to make plays. So, you know, hey, that it's not like they have all pros all over the place like the San Francisco 49ers, but And that's my defensive wink. But is, I don't it think, sucks that a good coach is leaving. So here's where I do push back a little bit on the whole like, well, the like well, they had they had a bad offense, so how could how could they ever have a good defense? Well, the Jets had the twelfth defense with the 29th offense. The Patriots had the fifteenth defense with the thirty second offense. I mean, look at, the, Steelers, look at the talent that the Jets have, though. That, that's okay, the difference. Ag- agreed, agreed. But that's what I'm gonna say is I don't. I think Wink got the most out of his players for the most part. I think Xavier McKinney, while good in Wink's scheme, is better suited in a Patrick Graham style. Now the edge guys, they suffered, right? I don't care. That Kayvon is the first to look at it, and you know we can talk about just pass rush win rate or just sacks, right? But even Matthew Judon, his pass rush win rate exploded. Now, it wasn't just his sack totals when he um, when he left Baltimore for New England, but um, I. But so I liked his defense, right? Like the blitzes were tough to prepare for and were able to create pressure, um, you know, especially after the first five games. Like he forced teams to get the ball out quick and be ready for it. Like always had a, a low completion percentage against him while also having a low average depth of target. Usually those two stats don't work hand in hand. Uh, you know, also when you play so much man, you can't like you can't play man for 90 percent of a game. You can play zone for 90 percent. You can't play yeah. man. Which means you get to play that man coverage, but you also get to throw in all types of different coverages. So it just makes it harder to prepare for when you run those blitz. It just makes it – it's a hard defense to prepare for, and it's I think it's awesome on third down. They've been really good on third down the last two years. Um, I think he's a good defensive coordinator, right? In Baltimore, you know, in four years, he had the second, third, second, and 19th ranked defenses, right? And then the year they were 19th, all their corners got hurt. And, like – I think the linebacker group is a good sign of what Wink Martindale is capable of when he has good players. Look at 2022 with Jalen Smith, Tay Crowder, and Mike McFadden. It was the worst unit on the team. It was worse than the wide receiver group. It was worse than the offensive line. Well, that was probably the strongest unit of his defense this year when they ju- when they just added Bobby Okereke and Isaiah Simmons. They added a good player in Okereke. Again, not a Roquan Smith level player, but a good player. And a gadget player in Isaiah Simmons allowed Mike McFadden to get another year of growth and slide over to that number two spot. Um, and get there. So I, I think he's a good defensive coordinator. Um, but I also don't want to act like these defenses were amazing and the offenses just held them back. I think they were held back by talent. Um, you know, in 2022, they were 28th in EPA play. You know, uh, this past year, they were 22nd, right? 12th versus the pass, 29th versus the rush. Uh, you know, points per game, they were 26. And you know, we talk about, well, the in, when you say the bad offense, well, the Giants had the 31st ranked offense in 2020 and 21 uh, with Joe Judge as the head coach. Their defenses were ranked 9th and 23rd, both better than Wink Martin. Now, I think they had more talent. but So I, I think they can upgrade, right? And hopefully this is a John Harbaugh situation where you have this run-in with M- Wink Martindale, there's issues there, even though they, they deny it, there was reported issues, and then you get your Mike McDonald. I don't think, I'm not saying we have Mike McDonald coming down the pipe, but I do think we could – I hope that there's an upgrade out there because I, I like Wink Martindale. Not perfect, but I do like Wink Martindale as a defensive coordinator. Yeah, the Ravens got better after Wink Martindale is not a good enough uh, – is not a good enough reason to be optimistic about Wink Martindale leaving. I'm sorry. 
Um, <laughs> the the Ravens have talent, and the you know the Ravens under Wink Martindale had. And they a struggled top- before Kyle Hamilton got good, and they added Roquan Smith too. They weren't. Yeah, they didn't they, just get good overnight. They got Geno Stone. You know, Matabuke is a you know great first name. Justin uh, leading the interior defense alignment in sacks this year, and then Kyle Van Noy and Jadavion Clowney had like resurgence resurgent years, and Roquan Smith is an All Pro. Um, so, I mean, Kyle Hamilton's arguably an all-pro. Geno Stone isn't like an honorable mention for all-pro. So, I mean, yeah, that, that uh, uh, and, and Matabuke is an all-pro. So, they have, you want to talk about a defense that does have all-pros up and down, um, it is the Ravens. Now, is it because of, hey, you know, scheme? I'm sure scheme helps and scheme, you know, puts you in I mean, a good position. We've seen Patrick Queen get way better. Now, again, he yeah. got to slide over to the number two inside linebacker spot. So, again, I'm we're not the Ravens, right? So, you can't just, you can't draw comparisons no. like that. But there was run-ins with John Harbaugh, too, right? So, I... I do want to figure out what happened with Brian Dable, and I hope it does come out, right? And obviously, we follow Giants media, so we're more likely to hear the anti-Wink and Wilkins stuff, right? Because who do these people talk to? They talk to people within the Giants building who are trying to protect it. Uh, So hopefully, Jay Glazer, whoever, we can find it out. And I I hope it's more than yelling at guys. I mean, here's the thing. I I really hope it's that. Or actually, I don't hope it's that. I hope it is that. But I kind of want to hear... (laughs) I kind of want to hear anti-wink stuff at this point because everything that we've heard is that Dable's difficult to work with. So what's the other side of the story? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I, I mean, where context. have we heard that wink Dable's difficult to work with? Who have we heard that from? Basically, we've 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 seen the wink says I owe my players my composure. So, hey, if wink is MF and people or whatever or Dable is. I get it. Maybe you got to reel it in. But I also don't think that is solely worth it. And maybe again. Maybe it did start with Xavier McKinney because Wink went the exact opposite way and kind of undermined Dable a little bit. And then Dable gives McKinney the, you know, breaks the, has him break the team down after they win the next week. And that's essentially when all that shit came out, right? If that's when it came out is the week after that, you know, McKinney broke the team down after all that. Yeah. Um, no, but I've I've heard that they just don't like each other. But also I recognize that the person I'm hearing it from is a... It is on. It is in like Wink Martindale's camp. Yeah, and again, I hope Brian Dable t- does some self reflection in this and figures out what he can do better. Yeah, um, you know. But I. But here, th- what I get so frustrated, like, well, Wink's defense and Dable's offense. Okay, let's look at 2022 when they didn't have their starting left tackle go down and their you know deal with three quarterbacks. The the discrepancy between those two units was way bigger than the discrepancy of the offense and defense this year. Yeah. Yeah, but also, you know, I, I don't want to be seeing the box score of the two Dallas games. I mean, the second Dallas game. Okay, sure, but the they Dallas games matter. We no, got we got to play that do, Dallas defense too with I mean, the offensive line. L- listen the back offense. to the post game pod of Week One. It we were the defense was barely even mentioned because we were like, you know, the defense didn't even get an opportunity to play like a, a legit game because they would turn over the ball. The ball would be inside the Dallas red zone. They would allow. They would allow. I mean, I'm pretty sure even early in the game they would allow, they would allow like field goals or and then later in the game it would be touchdowns. Like we we were saying that the defense didn't play bad, so don't show me the forty to nothing score against the well, Cowboys. They got smoked like, by them in, in the second. Like they, they did not like they got smoked by Miami, right? So it wasn't like they were you know you know David going against Goliath. They no, were and, and their, again, what, like uh, they were getting their ass kicked when they were outmanned by talent. It's happened multiple times over the last couple of years. And, again, and you well, can say, well, well, the off, well, okay, what, what about last year when the defense had six interceptions for the entire year? Right. Like, do you think that didn't make it a little harder for the offense to score points? You know, maybe that's right. why they were ninth in EPA per play, but only fifteenth in points per game because they never got a turnover that gave them short for uh, the short field. Yeah, and you could say, hey, they they were sixth in EPA per play. I think from week nine on, uh, it was no, I'm sorry, week six, week six to eighteen, the Giants were. Um, 13th in overall EPA per play on defense, which is above average, and then sixth in EPA per or dropback per EPA. Um, and that's all, you know, basically a lot of that came after they traded um, Leonard Williams, which the run defense did really suffer from that too. It wasn't even that good with when Leonard Williams was here anyway. But um, again, I don't want to act like I'm not acting like Wink Martindale is the best defense coordinator that the Giants have had. He's a good since defense coordinator. Bill he's, Belichick. He's proven it. Yes. But- what, I'm not pissed off because Wink Martindale's defense is underperformed. I think with better talent, he would he would be 
like he can get to like one of those top defenses in the NFL. It's not that right now. I think with better talents there, he's shown it before in Baltimore, yeah. right? So this is not an attack on Wink as a coach at all. This is mean an attack on the na- narrative that like, oh, uh, this this dominating defense is just being held back by the offense. They had some dominating games, absolutely, but they were throughout a season were not dominant. Yeah, they were yeah, dominant when they the played start. Zach Wilson and Sam Howell and Bailey Zappi. Yeah, I said it at the start. I need to. I am way more curious about the process of this and how it went down versus the actual result. Um, and the only thing that's, you know, hey, coming up next for the Giants, uh, I wish I had a crystal ball and I wish I could be, I wish I could guarantee myself and guarantee everybody listening that I'm really excited about this this new defensive coordinator and, you know, we, we he's an experienced one and we know his system and maybe we can even watch film and see the tendencies of what he does and what he's about, but... We don't have that right now. So the next the next step is them to find their defensive coordinator. And, you know, I, 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 I hope we get to keep good position coaches like Andre Patterson and Jerome Henderson. I hope they survive this, but there's no guaranteeing that they that they do. So we'll we'll see. Yeah, I hope so. And hopefully we can, you know, we'll, we'll hear Wink's side of the story from the media the next you know few days. So that'll be interesting to hear. And hey, we got a whole defensive coordinator thing. So we'll we'll get more into like, hey, next defensive coordinator in our next episode, Justin, most likely. Um, here's what I will say. The good thing for the Giants is I don't think they have Wink Martindale scheme dependent players. Right? Now they've shown with Dex and Andre Patterson, Dex or you know, Dex belongs at the nose tackle. So no matter what you do, let's let's get Dex playing more nose tackle. Um I think the edges would actually do better. I think Xavier McKinney, if he's back, he would do better. Banks is obviously like drafted to play man coverage, but he's, you know, his he has better plays in zone right now as he grows. And as he grows into a better man corner, well, hopefully the next coach we have lets him play man coverage, right? Like I don't, I, I, we should, I hope we don't go to, you know, 96% zone type defense, right? You know, we make, even if it is a more zone base, let's mix it up. Let's run some man coverage and blitzes and stuff. So, uh, I think Okereke will still be a good player, but won't thrive as much uh, unless it's someone who lives in a single high. If he, if it's someone who lives in a single high defense, you don't need to do all that blitzing to make Okereke look good. But if you if someone who lives from light boxes, Okereke won't look as good. And the only other starter is Flot, but I'm kind of out on Flot anyways because he can't play the run. Right. Um, like the and then 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 you know Isaiah Simmons as a gadget player won't be back most likely without well I, yeah though. Isaiah Simmons is the player that it impacts the most because odds but he, are and he's not even a starter he's a gadget player right because odds are Isaiah Simmons would be asked to maybe play more conventional linebacker we'll we'll evaluate it all when when it happens and as guys get interviews I'm excited to see who at least who they're going to interview yeah it's gonna we'll, we'll whoever they interview we'll we'll break it all down for you uh, I don't I don't know exactly what our next episode will be maybe we'll have to push awards back um a week or so we also got to get dunlevy on tony award winner at the end of the season so this is true um and he'll at least tell us what he knows and not pretend uh he knows stuff when he doesn't like other people um i mean drew wilkins we don't need to go dive deep into that i mean they've, they've had a horrible pass rush win rate they have not been like Kayvon has carried that group and just sacks alone and that's it None of them are world beaters and as run defenders. Like Ward is a run defender, but he's also he's not a playmaker in the man and run. He can just set an edge and you know lever a, a pull, um, well. But he's not making plays as a run defender. Um, and Aziz Ojolari was never that. But I, so again, I, I'm not sitting here saying Drew Wilkins is this horrible outside linebacker. Coach. I don't know exactly what happened, but his unit performed poorly. It performed worse than the NFL. Right? Yeah. They. They, their pass rush run rate for the edges were 10%. The thir- that was 32nd in the NFL. 31st was 5% higher at, at 15% with the Rams. Uh, I mean, why don't you read an ad and then we'll talk about firing Bobby Johnson because this is like the celebration of the day. <sighs> yeah, I actually have our DraftKings Sportsbook ad up right now, an official sports betting partner of the NFL playoffs. Bo, here we go. They're bringing you the NFL playoffs with DraftKings Sportsbook. They're bringing you an offer that will help make the playoffs – Electrifying. Get some skin in the game. New customers can bet five bucks on any game and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. That's $50 more than the 150 you got before. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code WORLD. New customers can bet just five bucks. Get 200 instantly in bonus bets only 
on DraftKings Sportsbook with code WORLD. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit, visit, or visit, 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 visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text Open, hope ny 467 In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 8887 Eight nine seven 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 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash football for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gambling resources. Bobby Skinner, you'll be glad you did. Bobby Johnson, gone. Thomas Pagehi, gone. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Bobby Johnson first because that's... What's up, Siren? Sound the alarms. Uh... This was a real test for Brian Dable. Would he fire a friend in Bobby Johnson? Uh, so the Giants fired their offensive line coach, Bobby Johnson. Yes, I mean, they, their offensive line gave up the second most sacks in the NFL history this year, right? And that wasn't just like a product of a 17-game season. They had that going into the last week of the year. Now, a lot of that can be put on quarterback play, uh, but that's still really, really bad. I mean, we saw how bad this offensive line was went down with without Andrew Thomas, Right, it was it was putrid. It's some of the worst offensive line play we've ever seen. We'll talk about individual guys' growth. Tyree Phillips coming back, but you give up that many sacks, you're that bad as a pass blocking unit, Justin. And honestly, the second half of the season, what do you think was worse, the pass blocking or the run blocking? I I think the run blocking was much worse oh, in the second half worse. of the season compared to the pass blocking, right? Like now, Saquon's not the same guy he once was, but he's still a really damn good back, and I mean his numbers are comparable to 2021 coming off the torn ACL. Besides total rushing yards because, you know, he missed more games that year and had got more carries this year. They didn't have a split back system like they did with Booker then. Um, you know, 3.9 yards per carry had his, you know, the receiving's not his uh Bobby Johnson's fault, but like, you know, 3.9 yards per carry which is really bad. Um, you know, the, the running game was pitiful. Like all the other all the other backs uh, running backs had, uh, you know, 2.6 yards per carry when they got it, where last year they averaged over four. Saquon was 45th out of 48 guys in success rate rushing. You know, 64% of his games were under four yards per carry. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about individual players, but it was just a, it was, you know, since we've been doing this in 2019, I don't like to say historical because everyone just, that's like the new phrase. It's like historically bad. It's like, well, is it, or is it like the 15th worst of all time, which is really bad, but not historical. Um, since I've been doing this in 2019, this was the worst offensive line to cover. And I do O-line reports every week, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, they just couldn't run the ball. I mean, r- running the ball on first and 10. I mean, y- you get four or five yards and you're like, holy shit. I mean, <laughs> you know. It wasn't a given that you would just get three, four, five yards on, on a first and ten. I mean, for, forget running the ball on second ten. It's usually a bad decision, but it would be a death sentence for this offense because then it's third and long, and then the bad offensive line is allowing a sack on third down. So, yeah, I mean, not not being able to run the ball, but you know, where my where my brain goes to with Bobby Johnson is just the lack of development, and that's where you said we'll get to it. Well, I want to get to it. The lack of development with with the young guys, and you know Shane. You know I I forget who brought it up, but Shane uh, Shane talked about like Josh Azudu and Marcus McKeithen, but especially pointing to Azudu, being like, yeah, it sucks that the dudes, uh, you know, coming back to back seasons now of season ending injuries, but it's year three. He has to show something. Uh, Josh Azudu has not. Really shown anything, um, you know, in, in, in his in his first two years, the injuries do suck and it took away development. But I'm not putting my money on Josh Azudu developing uh, if he was healthy, getting better. John Michael Schmidt somehow got worse. Somehow the the technically best center out of this year's draft, who's 24 years old, not this raw young athletic prospect who's 2021. 20, John Michael Schmidt's 24 years old, same age as Andrew Thomas. Technically sound life lifetime center from the from the University of Minnesota Big Ten somehow technically got worse his rookie year as the year went on, um, and Evan Neal Evan Neal who was a slam dunk like you gotta have it guy and the only little the only little bugaboo on him that you know uh, that I think one of the Long brothers talked about is that, oh, he's a little top-heavy, and you got to watch out for it. Well, guess what? That's been literally the main issue, and it's been, <laughs> Evan Neal is one of the league's worst right tackles. This can't-miss, uh, you know, polished prospect out of the University of Alabama uh, has turned into one of the worst right tackles in football. Yeah, and, and that's one thing. Like, Evan Neal did improve on things this year, which, you like, that that's a shocking statement, but, like, 
He start, his footwork got a little bit better at the beginning of the snaps. He got out of a stance better. I do think his contact, and Bobby Johnson even talked about this, like his contact balance did get a better, right? He didn't, it wasn't great, right? He still had some unbalanced balance issues. But where last year it was just easy for guys like Hassan Reddick to just turn him around and, and, and get him, you know, take advantage of that yeah. top heaviness, like you said. But the uh, funny part about Evan Neal getting better. The biggest is, issues was his hands, right? This year, right. where it's like, if he could get, it's like, man, that should be an offensive line coach. And Bobby Johnson has talked about it. Like, yeah, we don't work on like football in season. We're just preparing for the other opponent, which I can't, st- I hate that shit, especially for offensive line guys. I hate that shit. Like, spend the time on the field getting better at football. You know, uh, John Michael Smith, like you said, regressed throughout the year. Josh Azuda, they begged him to win a guard job over Mark Lewinsky and Ben Bredesen, and he couldn't do it. Uh, you know, his hands were another thing, right? He's got all the feet, the feet for it. Uh, and then Tyree Phillips is, you know, maybe the biggest indictment, right? Like Tyree Phillips was always kind of a sloppy player with his technique. Um, you know, we watched him in training camp and he was bad. He was very bad in training camp and he spent six weeks away from this team on the Philadelphia Eagles practice squad while they're like, he's the lowest of their priority. Um, you know, the offensive line coach priority and comes back you know, six or seven weeks later and is a re- much more refined player and like a much better player than what he was with the Giants, where, where the Giants cut him for Matt Parrott to be their swing tackle. And then when they had to go to swing tackle, they said, actually, no, we're going to put our guard. We're going to put our second year guard at tackle over this. Um, you know, guys made mental, mis- you know, talk about, oh, they spend the time preparing. Marcus McKeithen made the wrong decision every three plays. You know, I've mentioned this 10 times. Evan Neal has made a bunch of mental mistakes. You know, the, the end of the half before the Buff- the Buffalo Bills game. If Evan Neal blocks the right guy and not just totally screws it up, the Giants probably score a touchdown and we're praising, you know, them being for being so ballsy to run it there. Um, Justin Pugh comes in. He's your second most technically sound offensive line. I mean, it was... It was a bad offensive line unit, and I'm not sitting here saying this a new old line coach fixes everything, right? I, I don't think I'm not going to come in. Whoever they hire, I don't care if they hire, you know, Bill Callahan. I'm not sitting here saying Evan Neal's fixed, John Michael Schmitz is fixed, Jocelyn Dude is good, but it should not have been this bad and this no. lack of development. No, and the ironic thing is, you've talked about this with Evan Neal. The ironic thing is about Evan Neal's improvements and getting out of his stance was one of the huge issues that his that he had his rookie year and you know you don't have to be an o-line guy like yourself to really figure out that Evan Neal getting out of his stance is it was a problem since training camp um his first year his rookie year the ironic part about that is that he was at Bayonne High School with the former a really good offensive lineman forget for, for uh, remind me who it was the o-line coach the former o-lineman NFL lineman that he was working with do you remember who he was working Sorry, out I was listening stance. to a clip what did you say um, remember the offensive lineman, the former offensive lineman that Evan Neal was working with on his stance? Willie and uh, Willie Anderson. Yeah, they were at Bayonne High School and <laughs> Bayonne High School's football field in the spring, and Evan Neal was working on that new stance. And you know that hey, that was uh, Evan Neal's impro- one of Evan Neal's improvements from from this year, and that was something that had nothing to do, nothing to do with Bobby Johnson. All all outside. Yeah, yeah. It's literally like all the improvements Evan Neal had, we saw day one of camp and pads, Justin. Yeah. Right, and it didn't go anything past that. Um Sucks. So, so goodbye, Bobby Johnson. It's been real. But I will say, and they fired Thomas McGahee. Justin, I, I do want to pat ourselves on the back a little bit. I remember the shit in Mobile, Alabama. I remember sitting in your hotel room on, with microphones up Grump. I don't know if we said this with Bobby Johnson because we interviewed Anthony afterwards. This, what were the two hirings of Brian Dables that were like, I don't like this? Yeah, we we had questions on Bobby Johnson, Bobby Johnson, and Thomas and McGahee. Thomas McGahee. <laughs> so yeah. let's talk, let's talk about Thomas McGahee, the special teams coordinator that was fired. Um, dude, dude came in with Pat Shermer and survived that, right? Like survived the Pat Shermer firing, survived the Joe Judge firing. And then had two years of Brian Dable when our special teams were really never an advantage. There was times where you look at the special teams and like, yeah, they're fine. Like 2019, the special teams were, were solid. But they really nav- never gave you an advantage as a unit. We're like, man, look at that. Right? And even in 2019, Aldrich Rosas regressed as a kicker from his uh, 2018. Um, and there was just so many times where it was at a disadvantage. You know, the first drive of the season, the Cowboys block your field goal, return it for a touchdown, and they were bragging the night before 
that they were going to that they were going to do that because they saw a weakness on film. We saw, we, you know, Thomas McGahey to me never took uh, accountability for anything. When there was ten men in the field in the preseason, he blamed it on, oh yeah, these young guys, they're they got to get used to it. There's nine guys on the field, um, in in other games, right? There's there's just so many issues on special teams, right? I mean, it was every game there'd be like two or three times where like, man, special teams are absolutely screwing us. Um, so I'm glad he's gone. I don't think it was ever an advantage, but I'm actually, to me, this was, this was a lazy hire by Brian Dable. Like one, you should have just went and got your own special teams coordinator anyways, for one, there was nothing about, you know, about those past two units that just screamed out great special teams coordinator. But I can't remember when, what interview this was and maybe research Rick could help me out. There was a, I think it was a McGahey press conference when they were talking about the Brian Dable, like the hiring process and they were halfway through the interview or whatever. And Dable's just like, Hey man, do you want the job? Like they didn't even finish it off. Like basically probably took people's in the giants buildings word on it. Like, Oh, good guy. This is, that's where the well-respected comes from. He was an assistant with the giants when they won Super Bowl 42. 2007 to 2010 assistant special teams coordinator. It, 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 was, it was a lazy hire by Brian Dable and I'm, I'm glad that he's fixing it. Yeah, special teams just don't be a disaster. So um, don't you don't use the wind because they knock down the dude. Meadowlands racetrack as an excuse as to why your 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 injured kickers with broken legs are have and and forty year old Mason Crosby's are having difficult kicking the ball. Yeah, just kind of like pathetic that excuse was right where yeah. it's like what happened up uh, dude they knocked down the ra- you're not gonna believe this they knocked down the racetrack wind's been crazy in that corner ever since they did that in 2022 by the way and graham gonna had a, like a great year by the way what was it um <laughs> yeah what was it that uh where he just like, kind of refused to answer the question he's like that's that's all i'm gonna say about that um he does seem like a nice guy so i hate have i hate like just like i wish he was good because there's like he doesn't he's seem well, like he's a, well respected. Yeah, I know. That's like that's that's what he is. He's nice. You know, he's he's nice to the people in the building. He's nice to people in the media. He's a nice guy. Um, very weird. So, I mean, do we have anything else, Justin? I mean, it's um, I feel like there's. Oh, I mean, I mean obviously, Joe, Drew Wilkins' Joe, brother was fired with Joe him, Shane's Kevin. press conference today. Brian Dable's press conference. Yeah. So the wink thing was the main thing out of it. I think. Joe Shane learned from his mistake last year of basically like don't don't negotiate against yourself in press conferences like which he did with Daniel Jones last year where basically it said he's coming back. Um, my other takeaways from it, what were they? I did uh, the Darren QB Waller, stuff. I really didn't learn anything from. Darren Waller is basically going to be back next year. He he kind of said might be the biggest takeaway. Waller's going to be back, which he, was would have been a conversation. Said, it's it's funny how Shane said, yeah, we're gonna have. You know, we need to have conversations with everybody. And then very much under his breath said, yeah, but we expect him to be back. Almost like he didn't want to say it, but he was like, that's like, why we do that trade. He's like, we do that again. We'll do it oh, again. He said that twice where it's like, oh, but what do you expect him to say? Uh, the fact that he said it twice and he said it and he basically affirmed it. And he also affirmed that Darren Waller would be back. I do believe him. It's like, well, what do you well expect saying we would say? do it again is not a, oh, what would he expect him to say? That's saying like, no, we, we like that. We, we aren't, we aren't mad about that. Yeah. Um, um, so Waller will be back next year. He referred. I've never heard this before. Um, you know, it also, you know, I don't listen to GM press conferences often, but he referred to the Giants draft picks as currency to possibly use to trade and maybe move around. So, um, you know, he referred to having four picks in the top 70 um, as currency, which I found that to be interesting. Um, you know, you're tra- trading that around. Um, what else did he talk about? Talked about looking, you know, did you view last year through some rose colored glasses? And you know, he kind of, he kind of said, yeah, you know, you know, I, I may be, I may be guilty of that. Um, so the DJ contract accelerated the clock a little bit where it's like, okay, we got to. Yeah. Make you do a moves. deal with Daniel. You see how it was structured. So you try to expedite the process and give him a chance to succeed. That's also could be part of the rose colored glasses comment. Um, so yeah, I, I think she certainly didn't rule out like drafting a QB. Like I, I think everything is in front of the Giants this offseason. Didn't rule anything out. No, and and you didn't learn anything from the QB thing, but it was like they're 
they're gonna evaluate. We'll, we'll, again, we'll uh, uh, we'll 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 get into yeah. what every, all everything. Um, oh, he's so, very he's very vocal. He's very vocal about you know da- Daniel's gonna be here, blah blah blah. But he's also very vo- very vocal about we're going to add somebody, and you know, whether that whether that be whatever avenue that they do. Um, I can't. I, there's part of me that I can't even imagine them putting more money. Like, how much more money are they going to put in this quarterback room? What's isn't what's Jones's contract hit this year? Yeah, I mean, if you take a first round quarterback, that's going to be a bigger hit than a backup. Yeah, I guess I guess that's true. It sucks. Tyrod Taylor's so injury prone. Oh, actually, I have. But if we were just looking for simply a backup QB, Tyrod Taylor would be the perfect one. He just gets injured every five times he gets touched. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's basically it. That's basically it. I would have loved to hear Wink, uh, not Wink. Uh, I would have loved to hear Dable uh, try and talk about and you know maybe get pushed about. Hey, there's some reports that coaches aren't working well with you. You know what do you have to say? But that was they avoided that by saying that we expect both coordinators to come back. Okay, cool. So that's that's not going to get asked about. And odds are the next time I would even like to hear what Shane's thoughts on that. Because Shane and Dable are that close where that would be an appropriate question for Joe Shane. But next time that I think any of them are going to speak is the combine and free agency, the draft, and Daniel Jones are going to be the main topic of conversations. And all of this, they're going to have their defensive coordinator and all of this will be forgotten. Which, hey, I mean, if if this is on Wink, kind of like, like you're saying and like you're theorizing, if this is all on Wink, then good for them for brushing this under the rug. We're going to move on. They're going to move on. Um, and they basically can control Wink de- Wink's destiny now since he resigned. Yeah, and again, I, I I wanted to hear that shit too, right? That's where it's like, man, I, you know, I before this all happened today, I was just kind of like, okay, it's going to end, it's going to end. I don't want Wink Martin to leave. But once it hit today, it kind of just all hit me, and I kind of was like, you know what? Like, I don't mind them giving a screw you back to Wink Martin after all this, right? And maybe that was just like the hope that maybe that they could work this out. That it's like, okay, but when it once it actually hit, you know, um, I'm I'm totally like, okay, again, I, w- I want to hear those answers, right? I, I I absolutely care about that stuff. I like, I do I have worries about Brian Dable that I didn't have before this Wink Martindale stuff? Abso- absolutely, right? Um, but again, I I it pisses me off the way that Wink Martindale handled all this. Do you think shit hits the fan with Kafka, and if and if Dable wants to take back play calling, do you think that 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 could be something that's on the horizon? I don't know, but at the same time, like if Kafka wants gone because he's not the play caller, that to me that's a totally different situation with Wink Martindale because that's like for a football reason that right. they are parting ways. Okay, right? Like, and that's another that's that's just like a thing we won't we can't know. Like, what is like? Yeah, we like the things we see on offense, Justin, but. What if that's like all Brian Dable orchestrated and changing his stuff? And hey, what if he was essentially calling in the plays to Kafka versus Arizona in the second? Like mm-hmm. stuff like that. Then it's like I'm on. So is, if that's for a football decision, right? And would anyone blame Kafka if his reason to leave is, well, I'm not calling the plays. I don't I don't want to be here. Right. Um, right. But I but I hope Kafka is back and does call the plays. I hope it's not at that point. So. I agree. Um, but hey, we can't assume anything uh, just because you know Dable said he expects them to be back. So, yeah. um, uh, two more things: Brandon Brown got is getting a interview with the Panthers GM job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we and, can't lose him. We have no idea what he does, but we cannot uh, lose him, right? Because we've hit on these, these last two drafts have been the best drafts ever. Yeah, these old linemen that you can't that you just can't miss. <laughs> Which okay. again, it's not a shot at Brandon Brown, but the idea that like, like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like I don't know what this guy does. He could be brilliant. He could be the worst assistant GM of all time. Yeah. I don't know. And it's kind of it's why it is wild to see. Like this is an outside guy that Shane had no zero connection with, and they really are like attached at the hip. Like you see it at camp. They're they're always side by side. They're always talking to each other. And it really does seem like Shane puts a lot of trust in him, even like from day one in 2022, put a lot of trust in him. So, hey, if that if that's if that's a good partnership, I liked last year's draft class. So if that's a good partnership, then then let's continue to ride with it. Um, and then also cryptic posts by Cam Brown, Carter Coughlin, 
Jihad Ward, but Jihad Ward understandable when Wink Martindale leaves. But cryptic post by them basically saying already goodbye from the Giants. I didn't so. see the Jihad Ward one. So pe- people said that Ward had. I should have looked it up, but I, I heard well, we're, that. We're, all, we're blocked by Jihad Ward, so it's hard right, for us yeah. to see that. Um, yeah, at, now at the end of the day, like I would like for Javarius Owens or you know other young players to take those roles that Carter Coffin, instead of having to pay them the vet minimum, just pay you know sixth and seventh round rookies. Um, I don't know if that's from the exit interviews because they now they the way they handled exit interviews was weird, right? Where they did yeah. group exit interviews and then said, "Hey, you have an open door policy." Um, so I don't I don't know exa- like obviously I like I like those guys as special teams players, but I don't think anyone will have any bones about moving on from them to get new special teams younger players. And also, I'm I'm like Jihad Ward. I don't care how good of like he's. Uh, He's not good at outside linebacker, so I'm no. not. And you know, I thought he could have been a surprise cut in 2021 or 2022, Justin. Um, at that point, when everyone thought Quincy Roche was clearly better than him, um, so uh, that's that's all we got. So we'll be back sometimes this week, Friday at the latest. Um, again, I, I do want to get some things on. Like we got to get to our award show. We I want to get Ryan Dunleavy on to you know Tony Award winner, but. So we'll play it by ear with news. If anything big happens, we will be back. Do you know where um, Dunleavy lives? No, did you get the trophy and stuff yet? I, I there's packages that are my name on. I, I got the shirt, and I think I think I got the trophy that that came with it. I I want to see maybe 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 I'll invite Dunleavy to the New York office. Yeah, do it. And if he says no, then we'll just do it over Zoom. But I mean that that could be a good. It's like I need to give this to you anyway, or or the you know the warehouse, or the warehouse could could do the warehouse too. The warehouse is kind of shittier. I'd rather him his first his his first exposure to the company is a, a nice office. We'll text him and ask him. <laughs> I will text. Um, him. All right, that's an episode. Uh, we will be back whenever we see you. Appreciate you guys. Um, we will see you then. Until then. What am I going to do for the intro song? People already know when they listen to this. Until then, let's go big blue.